Gut, wir kommen zum nächsten Talk. Ich hatte von einer Freundin erzählt, von dem Talk, den, den ich jetzt heralde und sagte Machine Learning und Deep Learning und TensorFlow und sie guckte mich entsetzt an und meinte nur, oh shit. Ich muss gestehen, ich habe keine Ahnung davon. Ich bin froh, dass ich die vier Grundrechenarten kann. Ähm, es gibt eine Menschen, der Deep Learning, Machine Learning und TensorFlow die Bibliothek beherrscht und damit auch umgehen kann. Und der erzählt uns, wie man damit sauber programmiert, wie man Dinge richtig gestaltet und richtig macht, damit es auch zu einem Erfolg wird. Michael studiert am KIT und macht gerade seinen Master in dieser Thematik, in, in Informatik. Und er möchte uns darüber jetzt was erzählen. Es wird anschließend noch ein bisschen Q&A geben. Um, this talk, dieser Talk wird auf Englisch sein. Versteht jemand kein Englisch? Okay. Um, so, I repeat in, in English. Um, so, this talk will be about machine learning. And I, asked, I talk, told a friend just a few minutes before about this talk and mentioned machine learning and and deep learning and TensorFlow, and she said just, oh shit. So I have no clue about, but Michael, he has a clue. He studies uh, informatics at the KIT in Karlsruhe, and he's doing his, his master, and he's now going to tell us about how to manage and how to handle these, these topics and writing nice code. So, please, applause for Michael, applause Michael. Thank you. So, um, as was already introduced, um, I'm going to talk about good patterns in deep learning with TensorFlow. And a short disclaimer up front, this talk will not about deep learning and the theory behind it, but just implementation stuff and how you should write good code. Um, and so I want to motivate a little bit why this is an important topic. And for that, of course, you have to start with examples where you can use deep learning. And the first, probably most uh, um, famous example is uh, called MNIST, which is about um, recognizing written digits by a human. And so this data set was already introduced back in the 80s, and um, it's nowadays used by the um, postal offices around the world to recognize the postal zip codes. And so that is an example how you can um, use machine learning. And Another example, which is more recent and it's uh, upcoming just these years, is for autonomous vehicles. They have to perceive their surroundings and that can be done via computer vision. And in this example, the uh, Kitty Road data set is about detecting, in, in this image you see in red, where there is a not drivable region, and in purple where the um, vehicle can drive. And there's also another task in this image, not just the segmentation where you can drive and where you can't drive, but there's also the bounding boxes. And so this task is quite... Um, it's, it's a very difficult task and you have many different goals you have to do. And so you need a good code structure to, to actually solve those problems efficiently. And we will need s to solve so, such problems in the future much more than we already do. And so I'm giving this talk to, to make you ready for the next problems. And here's actually a data set that I collected myself. Um, and it's for navigation for blind people. Because blind people in parks, they have difficulties um, recognizing where the paths are because with their stick, the path is very difficult to distinguish from the grass beside. And so that's a possible task that you can solve with machine learning with deep learning and computer vision. And there are many tasks like those out there waiting for you to solve them. And then finally, there's another example for maybe um, a bit more for our German. <laughs> uh, um, it's about person identification and that's uh, mainly important for security uh, issues. And in this case on the left hand, we have uh, our Angie and um, we want to know if the person on the right image is also NG or if they are a different person. And so that is also a, a task that's really important for the security sector to, 
reliably identify persons and for example if you want to identify terrorists you need with a high accuracy to be able to tell who is a terrorist and who is not the same person as that terrorist. And so if you look around, lots of research going on and I'm coming from a research background um, and the problem is if you look at research code there's the spaghetti monster and I'm not talking about that uh, flying thing with the spaghetti tentacles but I'm talking about bad code. And in this example, you can see this code. It's a real model that's very popular. Um, it's open source. You can all search it later if you want to, but I'm not going to tell you its name because I don't want to put them um, up front. And this code has 2,800 lines of code in a single file that defines your model and everything that you need for the deep learning. And if you want to build on top of that model, it's horror as a developer because you have to understand so much code just to, 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 to change something. And so what I want to tell you now is how you can avoid that spaghetti monster with your code. Because quite honestly, I'm a bit selfish. I want to work with your code, but I don't want to read your code if it's like the code in this example. And so I hope you will learn something in this talk. And then there's another reason why you should care. And there's this quote by Steve McConnell that there are 15 to 50 errors per thousand lines of delivered code. And well, you can do the math for this example. And we actually found some bugs in that code. So yeah, you should reduce your amount of lines of code. So OK, then the question is, let's solve that problem. But how do we? And, and I will tell you in this talk some ideas. Those ideas are not the, the gold standard yet. There is no gold standard we have to evolve a gold standard. And so I'm just telling you ideas and I hope you can evolve those ideas and take them into your own code and make your code better. And so yeah, let's tell you. So first, how does deep learning in a nutshell work? Because our code should reflect the, the actual thing we are solving to be understandable. And so with deep learning at the beginning we have a problem. I used ng in this case. We want to detect if that is ng or not. And then with the, when we have a problem, we want to develop a model that models our problem. Um, in the case of deep learning, the most popular model nowadays is a CNN, um, a convolutional neural network. Um, I'm not going to explain how it works. You can Google that later if you don't. Um, and that CNN, basically what it does, it takes in an image. And then the output is a prediction. In this case, the prediction is it's ng with 99% accuracy or it's 99% sure that this image shows Merkel. And, well, while in this example it's correct, maybe if we feed in another image it would give a wrong result and we don't know that, so we have to check the quality of our model somehow. Um, and this is not the deep learning terms yet, this is just the intuitive way of seeing the problem. And for checking the quality usually we want some error measure and with that error measure, then later we want to somehow improve our model to be better because we want to reduce that error. And as it turns out, this intuitive view on the data is the same as actually if you're looking at it with the terms of machine learning. The first one is defined by your data. Your data basically tell you what your problem is. And so that's the first stage. In the case of detecting ng, that would be images of ng and images of someone else. And then the label if that image is ANG or if it's someone else. And so then the model, it's still the model, it's a CNN. The error or the, the quality measurement is called a loss learning. Um, and then the, the step is called the optimizer. And so what you can see here actually is that if we look at this, we can see already that the, the, the problem is separately separated in four different categories. We have the data category, the model category, the loss, and the optimizer. And so why do you put all that together in a file when you're coding? Why don't you put it into four different files? And so my, my first design pattern I propose, and it's really simple to actually implement, is not to write that everything in one file, but split it among four files. 
one file which handles the data loading and management, the next file which actually then um, handles the model implementation itself. So that's just the neural network in this case of deep learning. And the next file would be the loss. And what you commonly see if you look on GitHub that people mix up the model and the loss especially. And um, that code tends to get unreadable. And then the last step would be the optimizer, um, which we can also separate. And so that basically um, should help you to get rid of the spaghetti monster to some extent. But then once you started doing that, you're getting quicker in development, your code gets better readable, and you can start um, evolving beyond that. And then you will run into the problem that you're really quickly developing new experiments on your data, new model types, new loss types. And then you're running all those experiments with different configurations, and you start to get you're losing track of your experiments. You don't know what experiment was run with what, and so the next pattern... Oh, damn it. <laughs> Wrong uh, order. Um, the next pattern is actually using a hyperparameter file. Um, and in this hyperparameter file, you put together all your hyper information about the network. In this case, this is for MNIST. I put in there the... Uh, you can see the learning rate on the top. Then you can see there's some other uh, parameters for the optimizer, like decay and more stuff. I put there where my stuff gets saved in which directories. And so later, when I'm looking at my results of the experiment, I can put that parameter file next to the results. And when I've done like two weeks of experiments, then I can look at the experiment which got the best results. I don't remember what the code for that result was, but I can look in the hyperparameter file which tells me what configuration I ran. And so, while this is a bit, well, you, you can think of it's unnecessary, but I can tell you from experience that you really should do this. And the other hand is, if someone else wants to try your code and tinker with your code, then he can look into the hyperparameters file and really quickly change, like, the data input directory or where the checkpoints are stored, and he doesn't have to look all through all your code and find okay, where does he um, save his stuff on slash magic slash stuff with deep learning? Um, and so it's far easier for, for someone else who sees your code on GitHub to use it. And so then um, another pattern I want to propose is uh, functional programming. Um, many of you might don't like functional programming, um, but I think in the case of deep learning, it actually fits the mental model. Because I don't know um, who of you has heard a lecture on deep learning, but the first thing they will tell you is that a neural network is a universal function approximator. Already, the definition of a neural network is function. So why do you use object-oriented code when it's a function and you can compose functions? And so then you start a new way about your neural network and your code better matches um, your, your thought. Because you can think of, like I've shown on the bottom, if you have a detector network, it's composed not of one single network, but actually it's different functions. On the first layer you can have, li or on the, the first function you apply could be a feature encoder. Um, in this case I chose VGG, it's quite And what that feature encoder basically does, it takes in the image, and then it turns that image into some set of features, and then you can apply the next function, and that function transforms those features into the labels. And this sounds a bit like a traditional computing uh, pipeline for computer vision, but actually all you do is make your code a bit more structured so that in your code you can understand which layer of your network is responsible for what to do. And the thing here is that if you, uh, in this case, I chose the um, encoder, but Funnily, I can swap that out for the um, Google Inception v3 encoder or something else. And if I have this functional approach, all I have to do is just swap out one function. And I can concatenate all those functions together. And so coming from the background that a neural network is actually a function approximator, if your code reflects that function, you start to think that way.
This might be a bit overwhelming at the first to, to, to understand and grasp, but if you start writing your, your code in a functional way, you will see how it changes your thought pattern compared to, to object-oriented programming in this case for the model. And the same is true for the loss. Your loss is basically also a function and your loss uh, just transforms the uh, label that you are getting in. The label is the ground truth and the prediction of what your network said. In the case of Angie, that would be the 99% and a true for it's actually Angie. And what this function does, it transforms those two inputs into a output which just tells me I'm off by 001%. And you can also stick together if you're getting to more complex stuff, more and more loss functions. And so this, is, this might sound a bit uh, scary, but um, we'll see some code um, in the soon. So let's get back to our first uh, design pattern and actually look at how we can do that stuff. Um, because to now it's just like ideas and I thought, well, at a hackerspace I need to show you actually how to do this stuff. Um, and for the data stage, the data stage, usually you have some data set and your data set consists out of some features. In this case, on the left hand, you see the uh, images, the raw images and some labels for those images, which are basically the ground truth that you want to, uh, as a result, output for your network. And your data set only ever consists out of features and labels. There's nothing, n no other configuration of your data set if you think of deep learning. There is just features and labels. So you can write your code in a way that it supports inputting arbitrary features and accepting arbitrary labels. And then you have general code that loads your data set and you don't have to change it for every single data set that you want to feed into your model. And that saves you a lot of time and it will make your code more readable. Because if you have understood one kind of loading the data set, then you will understand every other way of loading the data set because it's the same, basically. And so, as I told you, they are the same, basically. So what you can do then is you can go ahead and create a data lake, or some call it a data store, and that's basically a central place where all your data that you have in your company or in your private life or in your research academy, and you put all that data together in a central place with a unified API. Like I told you, it would be something that outputs a feature and a label. And you can gather all the data you have in that way. And then if you want to, to do explore some deep learning, you can just take that data out of the data lake without the need of complex data transformations. And if you look at the um, existing data sets, if you're just a private person who wants to tinker around, there are also data lakes, uh, for example, uh, in the Keras uh, library that you can use to load uh, some data from other people over unified um, access. And then if you have loaded your data, this is one important step that most people forget and it's so important it's not really a pattern but I want to point it out um, that's inspect your data before you start writing any model have a look at your data is your data uh, making sense do you have enough data is your data balanced or, or unbalanced for example if I only have images of uh, Angie and then I have one image of let's say Obama and I want to try to learn what is Angie and what is Obama, that's almost impossible because I only have one example that's a false example. And so it's really, really, really important to make sure your data makes sense. And the other thing that you can detect if you inspect your data is if you have any bugs in your code. Because sometimes it happens that your image loading is bugged somehow or that you loaded an image flipped or the colors are not in the correct order. And if you inspect your data, you will see those errors. So don't skip that step. And it might take some time, but it's worth it down this line. And so how can you actually implement a, a data set or a data lake if you want to implement your own? Um, because I guess most of you want to tinker some and don't want to use a pre-existing one. Um, and so one way I found it, uh, it's, it's very uh, convenient and easy to use is that you have a function that loads your data set 
And this function outputs you a generator and the parameters for that generator. And I don't know how familiar you are with um, Python, but I guess generators are a concept that's in many programming languages. But there's one thing that's special to Python. Python has a, a weird way of multiprocessing. And TensorFlow is a library for Python, so we have to deal with that weird way of multiprocessing. And as it turns out, one of the most efficient ways of multiprocessing is using pooling. And for those poolings, you can have real multithreading. Otherwise, it's a single thread. And to not run into the scary word, you can Google that if you don't know it, the global interpreter log, um, you have to make sure that your functions are not relying on one shared object. So the way I found that works best in Python is having a generator, a set of parameters that is just a dictionary or something that can be easily copied, and then having that parameters for every single generator thread separately and not sharing any data between them. And your generator, of course, because it's multi-threaded, needs some sort of stride offset and um, probably it's useful for you to have a function that you can call an infinite time amount of. So yeah, um, and what can you do with that generator? How do you plug that generator now into your training? Because TensorFlow has an API which only either accepts one generator or which accepts a completely different time of data. And the completely different type of data is TF records. TF records is basically some database, and this is very specific to TensorFlow. Um, TF records is uh, some kind of a database which, can, which is designed to be readable very fast, and the data can be almost directly transferred to the GPU with the least amount of delay. Because in modern systems, the GPUs are so fast that the bottleneck, if you don't write your code carefully, will be getting the data from the memory, from the hard disk, to your GPU. And TF records are, is a, 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 a data format by TensorFlow, which is optimized for speed, so that the, this bottleneck doesn't appear in your code. And there are simpler ways um, to, to, to get your data to the GPU. But if you're really serious about deep learning, I recommend you invest the time into understanding how TF records work and use them. And what I did, because I don't want to write that same boilerplate code all over again, I wrote myself, since I have a unified API with the generator and the parameters, a function that's called write data. And this function does write TF records. They are stored on the hard disk. And then later, I have a function that I call read data, which just opens those TF records and then outputs me a tensor. So I only had to write that write and read data once because I realized that there's only the uh, label and feature tensor that you should care about. And I can reuse it for every project. And the, the implementation is agnostic to how my label tensor and my feature tensor actually look. And so that's also something I would recommend you. Either use the, the implementation I found or find your own implementation that's um, agnostic to your data set so you can use it for, for any data set, the same implementation. And this will also reduce you a lot of headache because um, writing and reading those TF records is not as straightforward as you might think. Um, and you will have weird bugs if your implementation with writing those tensors has errors. And some of these bugs might only appear after you have already trained five hours. And you don't want to have a bug that only appears five hours after you started your work. And then you have to start over all again. And that just is, um, well, annoying. So yeah. Um, and just recently, um, I, maybe some of you know, there is Google I.O. currently in the USA. So it's sort of a um, difficult spot to give this talk because they are just now announcing a lot of new stuff for TensorFlow. Um, and there turns out to be a new guy, TF Dataset, which actually also supports loading those um, TF records in a very efficient and fast way. And I'm not yet sure how useful that guy is going to, that method's going to be, but maybe you should keep it on your, on your um, radar in the future it might evolve into the new gold standard for loading data into TensorFlow. And so I just wanted to, to um, point it out here. And it basically will replace the read data part. 
So now we have loaded our data. We have it in some, some tensors. And tensors are basically a, a variable in TensorFlow on the GPU. And what we now can do is we can actually define our model. Um, in the image here, you see one of the most famous models of the modern age, uh, the Inception V3Net by Google. Um, and as you can see, that model is quite complicated only if you look at the, the, the graph already. And now if you try to write some code that's, well, not really straightforward, and then if you imagine um, down here, there's some, some, some loss. This is the loss of the network that's uh, in this white box. Here is another loss. And on the right hand, you have another loss. So you have three losses in those network. And if you now don't do the splitting pattern I um, explained to you at the beginning, then you will have a, a super uh, difficult to read code. Because you will have, well, somewhere here in the middle a loss, then you will have somewhere in the, the upper end of your network a loss, and at the end, and if you want to change your loss to fit your own problem, then you maybe find the loss at the end, but you don't find the two losses in the middle of the network, and then you wonder why nothing works for you. Uh, and that's very disappointing. So in the model, you should just write your model. So all, everything in here, that's colored, basically. And for your model, you should look at reusability. Um, and that's the, the part that's uh, also addressed with the functional uh, programming style. Because if you put every part of your model that is a separate function and just serves one purpose, put it in a different function, so that if you want to compose a new model that's built of parts that you have already written for other models, like for example, you want to have a Merkel um, classifier at the back and you know how to write that, and now you don't want to classify Merkel, but you want to classify Trump, then what you can do is use that same code and use it in another place for your different network. And you just have to train it, but you don't have to rewrite all the code. And so keep an eye on reusability and put everything into separate functions into as small steps as possible. And the next thing that's a bit more difficult maybe to, to explain why that would be important is um, making your model multi-instantiatable. Um, usually you could think you have one model on your GPU and you use that model and you train it. But if you just train your model, you won't ever know how good your model is because if you show the model some data and you then later ask it uh, what it thinks of that data, it's like if you're learning for, a, um, for an axiom and you're just keeping going over the same old axioms, and then you, you realize, oh, well, I'm perfect at doing those axioms, but actually you just learned them by heart. And so to avoid that with the uh, deep learning, you need one model that's learning, and then you need a copy of that model to be executed on data that the learning model has never seen to make sure that it's like a test situation when you're writing an, an axiom, for example. You're seeing data that wasn't in the learning you're having new tasks to solve. And we want to, to test that generalization. So you need to be able to multi-instantiate your network. And there's a simple function call in TensorFlow. Um, and that's called reuse weights. And all this does is it, um, if your weights are called the same, if you call your two networks the same, then they will share the weights across them. And so you can instantiate your model one time, then you can instantiate your model a second time, and you could even do that a third, a fourth, or even more times. And then one last thing. Um, if you remember the 2,800 lines of code at the beginning, make your code simple. Write simple code. Don't write too complex code. And also think of your network not being your network if you publish it somewhere on, on the internet, for example on GitHub. But think of it, um, make it easy for others to wrap your network, to use your network. Give them API to use it. For example, if you have a special encoder, just put that encoder in an extra function so that they can use that module separately. Because we are software engineers, basically, and we want to, to engineer solutions for problems. And so write simple code and wrap it into other networks to reduce bugs. And now, finally, I'm going to show you some code on how to do that. Um, I won't say that this is the gold standard, but that's the way I found most useful, and it works for me. And so I basically have a function that says create model. It has some input at the top, 
the input tensor. That's basically what you give into your model. You have a mode that's basically telling the model if it's in uh, training mode or evaluation mode, because some layers might be different for those. And then you have your hyperparameters from the hyperparameters file, which configure your network. So you don't have a constants in your code, but you actually use your hyperparameters to, to trigger your if statements in your model. And then there's some, some technical bits. If you look here, the uh, width TF variable scope, um, I'm not going to go into too much detail why you use it, but just use it. Um, because if you're inspecting your network in a um, in tensor board and you want to see the structure of your network, you can then there search for this variable scope in this example, MNIST network, and you can easily find again your network. Because if you're having large networks or even medium sized networks, it get, tends to get messy in that view. And then the next thing, the scope reuse variables, basically tells you if I'm not in the training mode, but actually in the evaluation mode, use the variables of the training network. And then at the bottom, you want to define your network. In this case, I left a blank here because that would be a little bit more code. Um, and basically what you then want to do is that I found the easiest way to make your model reusable is just outputting a dictionary which contains every important layer of your network. And one important layer is your logits. That's the layer that's before the softmax layer. Then, of course, the softmax, in it's the probabilities that your network outputs. But also, if you have a feature encoder in your network, it might be the feature encoder that's an important layer that you want to return in that dictionary. And what, the, what this enables is if someone else is using your code, it, he can just call the create, uh, the create model method. And then you can print that dictionary on the console and dig into it and look what tensors do I have, what shapes do they have, do they work for my problem or not. And so this is a very easy interface. I think everybody can implement dictionaries. It's nothing too, too difficult or scary. Um, and, and so I think this is a, is a simple way of doing it. And you don't need complex solutions. And also you have to think of we want uh, to write kind of functional code. So we want to output every side effect that we have, and the model is the side effect of the create model function. And so then on this slide is what was on the previous slide, the to-do. Um, it's actually quite readable, um, but you don't have to read that. Um, the code is on GitHub if you're interested in the details. But basically, this is the um, complete implementation of a network that solves MNIST. Um, and the most important thing on this slide is that if you can, you should use the tf.layers API. Um, the tf.layers API is an API that's well tested, and you have lots of lots of predefined layers that you can just stick into your network. For example, convolution layers, dense layers, max pooling layers, and you don't have to re-implement them with additions and multiplications from scratch. And um, it's a well-tested and uh, much-used library. So then we have defined our model. We have our create model function. And that model was the code from the previous slide. And now the next step would be looking at the loss at evaluating how good our model actually is. And the loss function you see on this slide is the loss function from the previous um, model. And if somebody of you has uh, listened to a lecture on um, deep learning, this is the kind of an optimal curve, how it should look, the loss. It should go down at the beginning very, very fast, and, it, and then it should stay low. And as you can see here, our model starts to converge at about 1,000 iterations already. And then later on, it um, stays low no matter if I'm feeding it the training data or the validation data. And the validation data is the data that the model has never seen except for the validation. So it's not in the training process. So in this case, basically, um, if you have such a loss function, your model is well prepared and has generalized in a good way. What you shouldn't see is um, that your loss function, your validation loss is going up here at the end. And that's the typical case of overfitting. You looked at too many examples, and then your not network uh, just knows by heart all the, the, the exams that it has already written, but doesn't know how to write a new exam. So it doesn't really learn how to add one plus one, but it learned that 
1 plus 1 is 2. And if you give it 1 plus 2, it wouldn't know what the solution is. And so how do you engineer that loss function? And that loss function is very important for your network. And you have to engineer it in a way that your network will converge in a good way. And what it basically is, the loss function, is it's the clue between your model and the data set. Because in the model definition, we didn't have any knowledge about our data set, except that we have an input tensor. And that input tensor was the image, but we don't know anything about the labels yet. And so what the loss does, it glues together the predictions of your model with the labels of your data set. And those are the two inputs that your loss function gets. And it doesn't get any more inputs except for the hyperparameters. And it contributes a lot to the quality of your model. In the case of MNIST, we will see that the loss function is quite simple. But if you're training more complex uh, tasks, like for the case of um, autonomous, uh, autonomous driving, then your loss function will not be simple, but it will be like 100 or 200 lines of code to actually implement a loss that works well and that's robust to different situations. And so, again, for the loss, as for everything, I, I don't know why I have to tell you that, but um, people on GitHub seem to forget about it. Reusability is key. You want to write your loss once and then apply it to, apply it to as many models and data sets as possible. And there are some losses that are supported by TensorFlow, like the cross-entropy loss, and then the uh, L1 loss or L2 loss, um, that's the L1 norm. Um, they are not directly implemented by TensorFlow. Um, it's like two lines of code, but you have to write them always again, so you might want to wrap them in a function that's called L1 loss and just use that all over the place again. And then there's more complex losses, like uh, alpha balancing or focusing the loss, which are uh, state-of-the-art in papers. And those losses are a bit more involved to write, and you don't want to rethink how to write them every time again. And if you have a network that has um, problems with learning because your data set is a bit unbalanced, you might want to consider a focal loss, and then if you wrote it in a reusable way, you can just stick that focal loss in there, and five seconds later you have implemented your model with focal loss. And you don't have to read the paper again, understand how it worked, implement it again, and well, you will spend like one or two days until your focal loss works. And if you don't write it in a reusable way, you will waste those two days every time you write it again. And also the problem is that there is an open source implementation by the authors of the paper, but it's in that cryptic form that I showed at the beginning, so you can't use it in your own code because you don't understand how it works, because it's not reusable. And so if you um, discover a fancy loss by yourself, write in a nice contained function with as least inputs and outputs as possible. And so how does the loss function actually look like if you want to create a loss? In the case of MNIST, it's quite simple. Um, the inputs are our model and the labels. Um, why do we need the model and not only the predictions? It's because, as we have seen in of Inception, our model doesn't only have one output, but it had three outputs that are relevant for the loss. And so we need the whole model and all its endpoints. And then what we do is, um, well, the first line is um, just putting the node, the mode of the network in a nice string format um, so we can use that for our output printing. Um, and then the next step is, um, in the case of MNIST, we have to make our labels fit the output format of the um, model. And then we can calculate a um, softmax cross entropy with logits. That's the TensorFlow implementation of the cross-entropy uh, loss. Um, for this talk, it's not important to understand uh, what actually this function is. Just you, you should put some function in there. In this case, it's just the cross-entropy, but it could be some more complex function like the L1 loss or the focal loss. And then what you do is um, you feed your network batch sizes. You don't feed it one image at a time, but you feed it 16, 32, or 100 images at a time. And so you get 100 loss outputs. But your loss only can be um, one number. And so what you have to do is you have to um, 
reduce that into one number and that's the loss operation which you can see here with the reduce mean and that loss is then put into a TF summary scalar and that TF summary scalar is basically so that TensorBoard can nicely visualize your stuff and the metrics is another way of putting it um, into a way that you can visualize it um, we will see later what the metrics are useful for and so the two things that your loss basically returns is first the loss operation that's the operation that you have to optimize that's how bad your network is the error and then the metrics those are you can don't only have one loss but you can have all kind of other metrics that later will tell you how bad your network is performing because the loss is only one number and as you might already know from traditional debugging it's good to not only have one number of your code but have several numbers that you can dig into and so then when we have this loss number we can go to the optimizer and the optimizer happens to be in TensorFlow the simplest part that you can imagine is just one function call um, there is uh, the TF train library where there is the optimizers all common optimizers are implemented there they're in a nice clean interface you just give them the learning rate some optional parameters and then you tell them what they should minimize and in this case they should minimize um, the loss so the optimizer is no magic at all and so now we have seen how we can implement those four stages the first stage was with TF records the second was the model CNN the third the loss that we've seen and the optimizer was that one line of code um, and then with that optimizer we we have to to call that optimizer and and the way tensorflow works it first creates a compute graph and that graph is not executed it's just defined and by just defining the graph nothing happens and so you have to execute that graph and what you can use to execute it is the TF estimators API um, that's pre-written for you um, but it doesn't support very well the way of evaluation and training at the same time um, but they're changing the estimator RP right now so maybe in a month or so the estimator RP might be a very great way to do this so I wanted to point it out here um, here's some code that you can also see on the github but um, for the sake of time I won't go into detail this is just the proof that um, all the patterns that I described to you earlier are compatible with the estimators framework um, and the way I did it was because I didn't like the estimators and they d weren't giving me the flexibility I started customizing them um, via callbacks or I wrote them in a such easy way that I could re-implement parts of it as I needed it and so my implementation of the estimators is just 77 lines of code um, to train a network and I guess 77 lines of code is quite easy and quick to understand instead of like a thousand lines of code that are split upon dozens of dozens of files like the estimator um, and what I have in this estimator package by myself is just a train and evaluate method and an easy version of it that's even simpler um, we'll see an example of the easy version And so what does this train and evaluate do and what does the estimator do? Um, what they do is they merge those summaries that we defined in the loss. If you remember we had that TF scalar thing where we told it okay we want that loss to be visible to TensorBoard and they have to be merged with all those uh, values and then they have to be written into a log file. That's the first two things you have to do. And then you have to save your hyperparameter file into the log directory because if you don't do that the hyperparameter file is completely useless because you have it when you start the training but not later when you look at your results so you should that third step is the really important step and that's the step that the TF estimators API doesn't do for example um, and then the last step is a training loop which is basically just a for loop which calls your um, training operation and your summary operations and maybe some callbacks that you passed in and so here's all the code that you need to write a neural network it's that clean and simple you just go at the top and define your um, you, you import the helper functions the easy train and evaluate the uh, hyperparameter loader 
Um, I've pre-implemented them. I will put the GitHub link uh, at the end. And then you, you import your own create model function that you have written somewhere, for example, for MNIST. Then you import your loss function. And after that, you um, then load your hyperparameters using the load params method. And you call the easy train and evaluate using your hyperparameters, your model, and your create loss. And I guess everybody in this room, even if you don't really program Python, will understand what those lines of code do. And they're simpler and less code than the 2,000 lines of code we saw at the beginning. And also, we have seen how the complete loss was implemented. That were like 10 lines of code. We have seen how the model was implemented. And so all those pieces, it's quite little amount of code that you have to actually write to do deep learning with those patterns. So you don't need 2,800 lines. And so to sum it up, what patterns I found the most important, there are the first three patterns. The first was splitting everything into data, model, loss, and optimizer, and treat it as four separate parts so that you can reuse them. The second was functional programming, because a neural network is a universal function approximator. Keep that in your mind when you're developing it and using a hyperparameter file. And then, when looking at the data set, we saw that you should use the TF records. They are much faster. And that you should probably, in the future, consider using the data sets once the API gets stable. And then, um, for the model, you should use that reuse variables method, so you can have a training and an evaluation model to see if your model is actually overfitting or not so that you know if your model generalizes well or it doesn't. And then the sixth step that was a bit between the lines is creating summaries and metrics. And those summaries and metrics, they're plotted in the um, tensor board. And you can also plot them in matplotlib and make them available to you to inspect what your model is doing, because those summaries, they are basically your debugger for what's going on in the neural network. You have no chance to look into it except for those summaries. So take them seriously. And now after I've talked so much about deep learning, here's a quick disclaimer um, by Occam's Razor. The simplest solution is almost always the best. Not every problem is suited for deep learning. Some problems are better to use with a linear regression. If you look at your data in the first step when I told you to analyze your data and you realize it's some kind of a linear problem, use a linear regression. Don't use a deep neural network. It's overkill. And the same goes for decision trees, K and N. There's so many normal deep learning methods. Consider them first and look at your data, what fits your data the best. And if none of those traditional approaches fits, then the solution is probably a deep neural network. And so there's one last thing. Um, the code that I showed you is all available on GitHub. Um, in my GitHub repository, start.tf, I have um, on the main readme there are the examples, the exact same examples that we saw in this slide. And there's also the implementation of the write data, the read data that you can dig into into detail if you are interested or just reuse it if you want to. Um, and if you want to know how to actually implement something, visit my workshop later. And so with that, I'm open for questions. Wow, I'm deeply impressed. I understood nothing. Uh, are there any questions? Come on. No one understood anything. No one there has a question. There's no dumb questions. You can also ask me yeah. anything you want. If you want to know something about deep learning in general and not how to program it. Yes. Uh, OK. Uh, so. Uh, in my experiment, so uh, okay. Uh, usually, I don't have enough uh, data set as on the internet. Uh, is there any way that we uh, 
for example, I only have hundreds of samples, samples or thousand samples, not so much as on the internet. How is there a method that we can get more samples or, uh, yeah? Yeah, uh, I think I understood your question. Um, what you can do in the first place is um, when we're looking at that image, for example, when you're um, looking at your data and you realize you don't have enough data or if it's unbalanced or something, you can try uh, data augmentation. And the most steps there are uh, rotating your images a bit, moving them around, cropping them, scaling them, maybe changing the illumination. And if your data is unbalanced, you, for example, if we only have 10 images of someone else than Merkel, we can duplicate those images or reduce the number of images of Merkel and try to balance our data. And then there are, of course, some things that, that you can do with your model. Um, if you say, let's have, you only have a thousand images for a segmentation problem. Um, what you can then do is, um, and that's why reusability is so important. Um, you can, for example, go ahead and use the, the inception model. And you take this model and cut it off right here, just before the, 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 um, the final classification layers. You take those weights that were trained on millions of images by Google for you for free, and you use that encoder and stick it in the front of your network head that then solves your problem. And so that's, that's actually a good question because it um, demonstrates how important modularity is because you can just now use a module written by someone else and import it in your code. And you should also check out um, tensorflow.hub. It's a new API that was just released today, yesterday, or somewhere around that time. So, any more questions? Yeah. Uh, what about Keras? You talked about Keras. Uh, how does that? Uh, how that can can that be used? These high-level APIs. Yeah. Or how um, do they uh, fit into this uh, sch schematic? Yeah. Um, Keras is a, a an API that's designed to be make. But the problem with Keras is that it some makes deep learning simple, because you can't um, create your own. Um, optimizer in such an intricate way or your um, your um, loss as you can with bare TensorFlow. And what you can then do is um, specifically for that question, um, there is in Keras you can use all those layers like the dense layer and instead of putting them into the let's say a sequential model, you can just um, give them at the end as an extra parameter the input of the previous layer and then as the um, output you get your um, next layer and then you can stack them together like um, normal tensorflow code and you can then um, put them right in this slide where the to-do is you put your first keras layer and as an extra parameter you feed in your uh, input tensor then for the next you and you create your model in this way and then the last output is fed into the um, prediction step but you can't use the uh, sequential model um, wrapper. Okay. So, any questions anymore? Okay. You you showed us. Um, how to separate the encoding. After training, we, we have some nets that detect uh, several features, uh, and there are currently work going on for, for example, Lobe AI uh, to reuse parts of a, of a trained model to, to uh, use the features. Um, are you working on that as well, or you have any ideas on that, how to uh, play that out in the future? Um, what you can basically do is um, this create model function. I've uh, shown it here as if you have one create what you can do is you can call another model function inside your create model function and this way you can your uh, network 
um, the, the feature encoder part. I, I think you're talking about feature encoding. You have that as a model, which you then input here um, as a create model function. You just call that one. And then you have your separate part on, um, on putting heads at the end. If you want, I can show you some code on that later. Um, I have code for that. And so that's actually one of the things um, why you should do these create model functions, because you can then do that very easily without any hassle. Is it possible to um, extract the, classif the, classi the classes also next to the uh, weights and so on? Or are I forced to provide the classes? Uh, I'm sorry, I don't understand your question. Can you rephrase it somehow? Or you uh, can also uh, ask in German if you want to. Um, ich habe ein Problem, oder ich, ich möchte versuchen, ein Problem zu lösen, das, uh, von dem ich die Klassen vorher nicht kenne. Die möchte ich zusammen mit dem äh, neuronalen Netzwerk ähm, trainieren, sozusagen. Ist das möglich oder ist es aussichtslos? Um, das ist eine gute Frage. Um, also das, das Framework um, ist nicht darauf um, spezialisiert, dass man unbedingt die, die Labels uh, haben muss. Also man muss ja im Prinzip, wenn man hier diese API anguckt, müssen wir nur irgendein Model zurückgeben. Und in diesem Model haben wir in dem Dictionary irgendwelche Tensoren drin stehen. Wo ich mir bei TensorFlow gerade nicht so ganz sicher bin, wie man da Tensoren erstellen kann, deren Länge man gar nicht kennt. Ähm, also würde ich mir vorstellen, dass es das vielleicht ein TensorFlow-Problem ist. Aber im Prinzip ist, ist diesem Pattern, dieses Pattern, das so zu teilen, ist es egal, was das Model ist und wie das aufgebaut ist. Und auch dem Loss ist egal, wie das Model aufgebaut ist. Es muss nur irgendwie wohl definiert sein. Oder es muss nur irgendwie TensorFlow formulierbar sein. Und ich weiß nicht, ob man das Problem in TensorFlow formulieren kann, ehrlich gesagt. Weil auf der Grafikkarte braucht man ja feste Array-Größen und das ist dann ja schwierig, wenn man die Labelgröße nicht kennt. Wenn ich die Frage richtig verstanden habe. Ich könnte vielleicht einschränken, wie viele Label es maximal sind, aber das, was ich gerne wissen würde, ist, welches Datum welches Label bekommt. Das würde ich gerne zusätzlich zu dem neuronalen Netz äh, trainiert haben wollen. Ist das okay. möglich? Also das wäre dann im Prinzip ein, ein unsupervised learning äh, Prozess. Genau. Ähm, das ist, äh, also müsste eigentlich auch damit möglich sein. Ich muss zugeben, ich bin kein Experte bei Unsupervised Learning. Ähm, alles, was ich in der Regel mache, ist Supervised Learning. Ähm, deswegen bin ich dazu den, zu den äh, Details leicht überfragt. <lacht> ähm, aber also ich sehe nicht, warum das äh, mit, den, mit dem Pattern ein Problem haben sollte. Ich muss nur sagen, ich weiß nicht, wie man es in TensorFlow ähm, dann tatsächlich implementieren würde. Also eine Variante wäre natürlich dann mit Autoencodern. Aber im Autoencoder habe ich ja auch wieder ähm, ein Label. Also wenn ich zum Beispiel einen Autoencoder mache, wo ich lernen möchte, zum Beispiel ich gebe lauter Bilder von, von Katzen rein und ich möchte jetzt implizit Features von Katzen lernen, was für Features eine Katze hat. Und was ich dann machen kann, ist einen Autoencoder ähm, schreiben und dieser Autoencoder kriegt als Input, kriegt der Bilder von Katzen und den Output, den er produzieren soll, sind auch wieder Bilder von Katzen. Und das ist ein symmetrisches Netzwerk, und was man dann nach dem, also der Trainiervorgang ist dann wieder supervised, weil ich habe ja Input und Output sind bekannt. Das heißt, ich habe Katzen und Katzen, also Input und Output als Katze. Und was ich dann am Ende machen kann, ist, ich kann mein Netz Mitte durchschneiden und dann ist der Layer, an dem ich es durchgeschnitten habe, bis dahin ist dann mein Feature Encoder und da habe ich dann meine Katzen Features. Und dann kann ich nachgucken, da gibt es zum Beispiel Deep Dream, kann ich gucken, was diese Features bedeuten und kann gucken, dann, dann kriege ich zum Beispiel, wenn ich das eine Feature aktiviere, kriege ich dann, das wird nur aktiviert für Inputs, die zum Beispiel Nasen sind oder die, die äh, Nasenhaare sind. Und so könnte man, also das wäre so eine Art von ähm, Unsupervised Learning, die mir, die, mit der ich mich ein bisschen auskenne. Aber technisch, programmiertechnisch ist es halt auch wieder ein Supervised Problem. Ich habe mein, mein Unsupervised Problem so umgeschrieben, dass ich Label und Feature beides kenne. Uh, a practical question. Uh, your workshop, uh, where is it taking place uh, in an hour and is it going to be in English or all German? Um, 
I planned on doing it in German, um, but if there are some people who only speak English, I can consider um, doing it in English too. Um, th that's not the problem with the language. Um, the original plan was holding it in German. And for the answer where it is... Um, We have the far plan here. You know, it's in the HFG workshop room. I don't know where that room is yet. I have to explore that myself, but yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for this, for this talk. Um, yeah, applause. <laughs>